So one question that has crossed our minds over the years is like, all right, so this festival has 170 films this year. That's a lot of films. How do we get people to know what's playing here? People say to us, what should I see? What's good? How do I pick from what you have? And you know, we're the programmers. We say everything is good because it wouldn't be here otherwise. But the people who are the opinion makers and who really count in this are the people sitting on this stage. Because what they do for a living is watch films, nice job if you can get it, write about those films, and then provide everybody who reads their media the opportunity to listen to what they think, to evaluate whether what they think matches up with um, the kind of ethos that they have, then to take that information and decide whether or not to go see a film. So for many people, these guys are the gatekeepers of opinion, taste, and culture who are gonna mean the difference for a lot of people between whether or not they go into a theater or go to a film festival or whether they don't. And you know, these days, so many films go straight to digital platforms, how do you find something on iTunes if you don't know it's there? I have no idea, but these guys are the ones who bring things to life and give things value. And so I think this afternoon, the thing, what's gonna be fascinating is to hear over 100 years worth of collective wisdom, and a lot That's of that me. is Tim, <laughs> about how they do what they do, how what they do has changed so substantially as technology has changed, and how they think of their jobs, and what do they do to keep things fresh? And they have a lot of things to talk about. So Tim Miller, the arts and entertainment editor of the Cape Cod Times, is our moderator, moderator today, and he'll introduce the panel. But what we tried to put together was a group of people who represent a lot of, a lot of different kinds of um, media outlets, and uh, really a lot of different kinds of experience as being, being a film critic. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tim. We have about 90 minutes. They're gonna talk for a while, then I'm sure they'll get into questions and uh, let's all sit back and enjoy this. Thank you. Sure. So you want me to pass this around as we go back? We can, no? No, okay, no. All right. Okay, um, let's see, first of all, uh, I, I wasn't uh, sure that I was going to be doing the intros, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read what was sent to me on the intros, which came from you guys, but we'll, we can, you know, you can add. Uh, okay, so, Tom, Meek, uh, writer living in Cambridge, his reviews, essays, and short stories have appeared in the Boston Phoenix, the Boston Globe, uh, WBUR Artery, Cambridge Day, the Charleston City Paper, and Slab Literary uh, Magazine. Tom has spoken on film at Northeastern, UMass, and Emerson Colleges. Tom is also president of the Boston Society of Film Critics, and he rides his bike everywhere. And if you uh, <laughs> see his Facebook, you often see the results, I think, of his riding around. A lot of nature. Um, anyway, uh, oh, and by the way, uh, one of the exciting things for me as far as this panel is I really admire these writers, so I'm not gonna say it individually because then it would sound like BS, but it's really true that, that they're wonderful, wonderful writers. Uh, uh, let's see, okay, well, uh, Allison, Allison Johnson uh, is film editor of the pop culture website, theyoungfolks.com, as well as a weekly film critic for the Boston-based CambridgeDay.com and television and film critic at theplaylist.net. She works as a freelance writer for the Seacoast Media Group and is a member of both the online Film Critics Society and the Boston Online Film Critic Association. Next, we have Ty Burr from the Boston Globe. Uh, Ty has reviewed films for the Globe since 2002 and has written a weekly column on all aspects of cult, pul, blah, 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 popular culture since 2015. He is the author of the critically acclaimed books God Like Us, Gods Like Us on Movie Stardom and Modern Fame from 2013, and The Best old movies for families 2007. He wrote for Entertainment Weekly during the 1990s and program movies for Cinemax in the 1980s, which was something I didn't know and I thought, wow, how cool. Uh, <laughs> a member of the bad movies on cable TV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, a member of the National Society What's that? 
Never mind. Should, never mind. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, don't go there. <laughs> a member of the National Society of Film Critics and the Boston Society of Film Critics, Ty also teaches courses in film and criticism at Boston University and Tufts University. In 2017, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Criticism. Pretty impressive. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Valerie Complex, Com Complex is that her? Uh, Valerie Complex, uh, she's a military veteran, yay. Uh, freelance, yeah, really. Uh, freelance writer and professional nerd. Uh, as a lover of Japanese animation, comics, and all things film, she is passionate about diversity across all entertainment mediums, along with being a former writer for Black Girl Nerds and, and an approved Rotten Tomatoes critic. She has written for well-known sites and magazines such as The Nerdist, IGN, The Hollywood Reporter, and many others. And uh, just basically about myself, I've been the film critic for the Cape Cod Times for 39 years. I'm the features editor of the paper. Um, and that's all you need to know about me. <laughs> okay, so um, let's start. Um, one thing I thought we could do is, uh, before we really get into how things have changed and what the new challenges and opportunities are, to just talk about why, uh, Judy got into it a bit, but why we do what we do. I mean, personally, why we do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, maybe if, if we could all one by one just talk about uh, briefly how we got into film criticism and why we continue to do it. So, sound okay? So, Tom, you want to start? We'll just go. Uh, sure. Yeah, um, I actually grew up, um, the only films I really liked growing up were Godzilla movies. I really, <laughs> I mean, I, I grew up when there was only three channels, you know, and, and uh, all the movies I saw were mostly, uh, this was before Star Wars, John Wayne movies, and I was really sort of not into John Wayne movies, uh, black and white movies. And then when I went to college, um, uh, part of, I, I majored in English, and part of it was we had a cinema studies, and uh, everybody called it clapping for credit, you know. <laughs> and, and I and I I I I I played a sport in college, nothing uh, all that great. But it, like a lot of uh, athletes took they took clap, clapping for credit because they'd have their practices right after it. Um, and so the professor would come in, lecture about the film, tell you everything you need to know for the quiz next week. You didn't have to see, this is before the internet too, didn't have to see the movie. You, and once the film ran, everybody ran out the door. Well, for the first film I went to see, it was Yojimbo, Kurosawa's movie. And the only, the only movies I actually really liked were spaghetti western movies. And I saw this movie and I was hooked. I took every class as much as I could fit into my English major. And the second I graduated um, college and moved to Boston, Every uh, Sunday afternoon, when my friends on Saturday when they were going to the beaches, I was at the matinee, uh, watch, watching uh, whatever was at the Nickelodeon, the, the old art house we had in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually, I ended up writing for the Boston Phoenix, a great weekly paper that lives no more. Uh, was one of the senior film or one of the uh, writer film critics there, um, and I've sort of gone on and done a bunch of other things. WBUR in Cambridge Day are pr the primary places actually. So I'm Ali's arts editor at, at the Cambridge Day. Um, so um, yeah, and um, it's, I, I do it because I love film. I mean, I think, every, I think you're all here and we're all up here for the same thing. We all love film, we love talking about film. We just you know, chose this path instead of making the films, I guess. Yeah. Hello. Ellie? Yeah. So I kind of fell into it like maybe a little bit later, but I always knew I wanted to write. I didn't really know about what. I went to school for journalism. I saw a movie that I really loved, Almost Famous, <laughs> and that kind of put into context that I could maybe write about what I enjoy, which was exciting. I took one film class, <laughs> Tim's, in college. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I think, kind of helped solidify the fact that it was what I wanted to do because beyond it opened up a couple of doors of experience showing that people can do it still. And it showed me films that I hadn't seen before and it kind of opened up my worldview. Um, and again, it was just kind of finding out that I could write what, <laughs> about what I love too. And I think you know, being able to write about storytelling is really exciting. Um, and I still do it because I don't know what else really I could do. But also, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I, I really, there's just something really exciting about getting to do what you love, regardless of what you have to do to maybe fill in the gaps around it. Um, 
So yeah. Yeah. Allie, uh, uh, I'm so happy that she's a film critic. She was she as she mentioned she was she was a student in my uh, one of my classes. I, I used to teach at Suffolk and I still teach at Four C's. Um, and she was uh, she was just such an incredible student. I mean, she she kind of won my heart from the first class when I had everybody say what your favorite movie is, and she said Almost Famous. And it's like she gets it <laughs> because, I, because I love Almost Famous too. So I was rooting for her for the from the get go, and then her writing uh, was such a combination of um, uh, insight and passion, but just heart too, and. If you read her work now, uh, I mean, she's she's under Tom's guidance. She's yeah. only gotten better. She's such such a, a sophisticated writer too. But uh, um, you know, she's just she's she's great, and and uh, so she's very modest. But but uh, it's a good thing. Oh, it's right exciting that she's <laughs> up here. Um, okay, Ty. Um, well, you're saying you wrote for sites like what, Black Girl Nerds and Nerds.com. Uh, the Nerdist. The Nerdist, right? And of course, the Nerdist. <laughs> uh, but that underscores how I think all of us here, everybody on the stage, and everybody who does what we do at a certain point in their life, had to become just a complete and total nerd about movies in the best possible way. Um, and for me, I mean, you talk about seeing, you know, um, your Jimbo, and you talk about seeing Almost Famous. For me, it was Duck Soup. <laughs> the, Mark, the Mark Brothers Duck Soup, which I saw at age 14, because my mom told me to watch it. Uh, it was on like a midnight, but my dad, who had passed away, she said it was his favorite movie. Uh, you should watch it. Yeah. And I had never seen anything like it. Just insan black and white insanity. Um, and that was the gateway drug. Uh, and from that, uh, again, you know, talking about what, what Tom was talking about at Boston at that time, it was pre-video, it was the Revival House era. So it was the Orson Welles, it was the Brattle, it was the Nickelodeon, it was the uh, Alston, it was the Exeter Street Theater, all these places. Off that, the wall. Off the wall, the, the Kendall Square, uh, the uh, Kenmore Square, the Park Square, all these theaters that were showing old movies and foreign language films and midnight movies. And that was my education. Yeah. Um, and that's where I just was sort of a hardcore nerd, and I remember like going to see, I always joke about you know, going to see Betty Davis movies and sitting behind the little old lady that would say all of Betty Davis' lines just before <laughs> Betty Davis said them. Um, and, you know, that, that there are nerds and then there are nerds. Um, but uh, so I went to college, I went to Dartmouth actually, and ended up, be, which was not the place you go to do film studies, but I didn't know that at the time. Uh, I ended up becoming a film studies major and hopping over to NYU for a year. But learning to do two things that uh, interested me, write and watch a lot of movies and talk about a lot of movies. And, that, and there really is when, when you're doing film studies, there's a, there's a fork in the road between do you want to make them? Or do you want to write about them and think about them and talk about them? Um, and then there's a third road is do you want to go into academia, academia and teach about yeah. it? Um, I wanted to write about them. And I also grew up in the era of Pauline Kael, who is a hugely, hugely um, formative figure for an entire generation of people writing about movies. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, she was a gateway drug in and of herself, yeah. if you remember reading her stuff in The New Yorker. Um, I got out of college, I didn't go into writing about film right away, I ended up working at, as you mentioned, HBO Cinemax, putting terrible movies on, on cable TV <laughs> for about six years. Uh, I was kind of an in-house movie critic, uh, which was a conversation in and of itself. Um, I got out of that freelance wrote for a couple of years and ended up getting in um, uh, the front door at Entertainment Weekly just uh, as it was starting. Um, and I wrote for that magazine as sort of their chief video critic. And then the old movie guy. I was like the obit guy. If anybody died quick, you know, go, go to Thai. You can knock out an obit pretty quickly. Um, I did that for 11 years. And then the job at um, the Boston Globe opened up. And for a variety of reasons. I, I grew up in Brookline, yeah. Massachusetts. So it was, it was coming home. Um, and so I've been there for 2000 and, uh, since 2002. Why do I do it? Um, I always have to remind myself I'm doing it for the reader. Uh, I'm doing it for people to get information, not just to get information about m making consumer choices, but to get information, to get context about what is out there, what they're going to see. So I, I know some people read the reviews after, uh, read the reviews after they see the movie because they want to go in cold. That's fine. Yeah. Um, and some people want to know what they're going, getting, getting into. Um, so writing a review is kind of balancing those things as well. I think of myself as a canary in the coal mine. So, you know, if I'm dying for lack of oxygen, you probably will too. Um, you know, sort of an early warning system. Um, but the best part of it is that when I find a movie I love, 
especially when it's not a particularly well-known movie. And I think of um, the one that always springs to mind is Beasts of the Southern Wild, which came out a bunch of years ago. And I remember seeing that at Sundance. Um, and I remember I, I walked out of the screening, uh, and there was a, 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 another critic from New York. We like, looked at each other, and literally our just jaws fell open, and just looked at each other like, Ugh, what did we just see? And one of the great joys is being able to write about that movie and spread the word and get people out to see it because, you know, I think of movie, every movie is it's kind of its own two hour window of reality on a completely alien planet. And some of the alien planets are really, really familiar or over familiar. Um, and some of them are completely original and you've never even would have been able to imagine such a planet if somebody hadn't built a window onto it. Uh, so I like pointing out those windows. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Uh, why do I, I kind of fell into, I kind of fell into this by accident. Can you hear me? I'm really soft spoken and I'm trying. <laughs> um, I fell into this sort of by accident. I worked nights, I was in the military and I worked nights and during the day I would sleep but then I'd wake up and have nothing to do. And I was like, well, I want to talk about movies. And so this website called Movie Pilot, it's no more now, but they were looking for writers, it was just open, you didn't have to have any experience or whatever. And I come from the New York public school system, so I needed the help. So I went <laughs> into, um, so, I, so I was like, well, I can sort of expand you know, my skills here, because I've sort of been around the ballpark. Um, I was a film editor for two years, mm -hmm. I was an actress for four years. Um, I have done like a whole bunch of different things regarding film, and my ultimate goal is to be a screenwriter. But I was like, what's a better way to improve my writing skills than to write about movies and sort of think critically about them? Because I feel maybe it'll help me in the long run when it's time to write one. So I started in 2013 when I was still in the military. And I'm not in the military, but I'm still writing reviews. So I guess that says something. I, my first exposure to film was horror movies. Uh, I was too young to be allowed to watch those. but. I spent a lot of time alone as a kid, and movies were movies and music were something that I had to sort of keep me company. Mm. And the first movie I remember, I remember as a four-year-old was Nightmare on Elm Street, <laughs> and I remember being completely as a four-year-old. As a four-year-old, four. -year -old, four. I, I remember four. I couldn't tell you what happened yesterday, but I remember that. So I remember just being completely fascinated by what was happening and Johnny Depp is in it, he's super mm -hmm. cute. That's what I thought at the time. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, this is, maybe this is, is this what cinema's all about? Mm -hmm. And then I start, you know, watching different films, you know, being up after hours when I should be asleep, ready for school. And one of the, one of the most impactful films that I remember coming on television randomly on cable was Sally Potter's Orlando. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it was just a, a majestic experience. I was probably up to like five in the morning and I had to be up an extra hour. But I sat and watched the whole thing. I was about six years old and I was like, wow, this is really, really fascinating. And from you there- You saw when you were six? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And to be able to appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and yeah. I just really, I, I really That's had, an, from there I had an appreciation for film and as I grew up, I used to go to the movies by myself all the time mm. and just sit and go, you know, as a singular person, it was easy to see multiple movies a day. Don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> so it was, easy to see, it was easy to see a lot of movies per day and so I just started getting all of this knowledge and in 2013, I was like, I, I, I watch movies, I might as well write about it because I have opinions and I hate mostly everything. So <laughs> let me start writing. And my reputation just sort of built from there. I took a lot of chances, pitched a lot of places, received a lot of no's until people started saying yes. And then sort of the opportunities sort of spiraled from there. And um, right now, I'm, uh, I do, uh, I'm an IT technician during the day, but on the side, I, I write and uh, have fun with it. I have a little bit of a reputation for being, uh, excuse my language, a joyless bitch, but I, I, I don't care. Like, I, you know, I have a very high standard for, for films, especially Good. since my exposure was things like Orlando and um, Betty Davis was also one of my, like I've seen All About Eve and oh, yeah, yeah. I was, I think I've seen like a lot of her movies before I was like 10 years old, like Now Voyager, yes. All About Eve yes. and um, 
the private lives of Elizabeth and Essex. Like I, I, I saw all those four seasons. So I had like all a, little girls should see Betty Davis movies. <laughs> no problem, it's possible. That's true. And I, so I had a very high standard for for films, and so I have that reputation. But it's fine, you know. It, it gets me in the door. So mm. yeah, that's why I and, and I met just really quickly. I met Judy at Sundance this year, and uh, I was sitting down on a couch, just sort of like huffing because I didn't see, I hadn't seen any movie I liked yet, and so we just started talking. And she was like, well, you know, I have this, this film festival in Woods Hole, would you mind coming? And I was like, are you sure you're gonna want me in July? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but then, and, and here I am. And, uh, yeah, so that's how that happened. And we're glad to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, let's see. Um, for me, uh, just briefly, I, uh, I got a kind of an earlier start, than, except for you. I, uh, <laughs> When my parents would take me to everything. My parents were both movie nuts. My mom was more the, uh, um, the Misfits and uh, Midnight Cowboy, which was the only rated X movie to win Best Picture. Like in the 60s, those were hers. She was more adventurous. My dad was more the John Wayne guy. Uh, and he would, like we'd see the Sands of Iwo Jima, and he would name every supporting. That's John Agar. That's uh, <laughs> Dane Clark. That's uh, Richard Jekyll. So I knew all the, you know, I grew up. Uh, learning about all these people and being fascinated by movies. Um, my parents would take me out of school once a year and we'd go to downtown Detroit. Uh, fortunately, we lived near downtown Detroit, so it wasn't like a long <laughs> trek. And uh, 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 for example, when I was seven in second grade, they took me to see Lawrence of Arabia, mm. uh, which had just come out. And that was probably the game changer for me, mm. where uh, that was my duck soup, yeah. where um, you know, I mean, I already was love movies, but Lawrence of Arabia just sort of just totally blew me away as far as uh, well, so what? Why people think it's great? It's it, not just its epicness, but just the power it had over me. And movies have, from that point on, have continued to hold that power over me. Like like Ty said, for me, my two favorite things other than maybe baseball is is uh, our writing and um, and movies. So. You know, I feel blessed, I'm sure everybody does mm -hmm. here, that I get to do that for a job. It's just, you know, I, I never forget that. Uh, and that's why I continue to do it. So uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, and um, let's see what else. I went to Michigan, uh, and uh, sim similarly, not necessarily the film school right. to go to, right. but, when I, but I started, you know, fortunately there were enough where I could keep <laughs> seeing all these great uh, movies, so be exposed to the French New Wave or whatever, mm -hmm. just like, you know, for time to to be, uh, you know, seeing your Jimbo and then going from, you know, shooting off from there. Um, Can I say something really Oh, quick? yeah. Because I have no, I have a degree in psychology. Like, I didn't go to school for writing or journalism or anything like that. A degree in psychology is really important. <laughs> 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 I, I'm like, I, have, I, have, I, I don't have a writing degree. I'm hearing all of these credentials, and I'm like, wow. I just, I went to criminal justice school. I, you know, this that wasn't like the track yeah. that I had, you know, in mind, and it's just sort of amazing how things sort of change yeah. over time and the difference that a year or two makes, you know, before you decide, okay, so I'm not going to do counseling anymore, I'm just going to write about uh, movies, so it's just... I honestly think that uh, having a degree does not really impact on what we do, other than giving you the chance to um, see a lot of movies. Right. And, and, connect dots, right. you know, and, and build greater context. But honestly, given some of the movies we see, a criminal justice degree is probably going to be really <laughs> helpful for film criticism. I mean, well, the, the, the bottom line, I mean, I think some of the basic skills of being a film critic is, I mean, uh, first of all, you do have to be a competent writer. I mean, you know, uh, and how you get there, you don't need to study that. I mean, you have to have an appreciation of cinema history. Um, it's, it's really interesting to go talk to some universities and people are like, Godfather? You know, I mean, I, I just am dumbfounded that anybody would come to a film lecture and not know yeah. uh, really anything about the Godfather trilogy. Um, so you have to have an appreciation to put it, I mean, and Ty was talking about that, talking to an audience, you have to know your audience. I mean, you're writing for young kids, you're writing for 
<laughs> Old people. No, 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 no. You, well, you're writing for a general audience. I was just saying, you sounds like you write for a specific audience, too. So, I mean, you know, you have to look at the film, you have to look at your audience, and you have to put it in the correct context. Plus, you get different formats to write reviews in. Like, when I write for WBUR, if we do a retrospective, I'll write something that could be over 2,000 words long, you know. And that almost becomes an academic paper. So, right. there's, there's so many different things. But I think, you know, at least having the passion and also having a voice. I mean, I think... You know, if you're writing reviews, you got to have a voice no matter what format you have. Like, Ty has a very friendly city. You have, I, I, I don't know if you'll take this as an insult, but you have a little bit of that Ebert thing where you put it into every man terms. It's complex but simplistic. I will take that time. as a compliment. Okay, that good. I, I was, I didn't know, you know, like, I didn't want to. No, well, you know, going it's St. Roger. You've referenced St. Roger. Yeah, I, 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 I was, I, he was, he was somebody I was uh, influenced by. But, I, you know, so just going Thank to you. what you were saying. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think a degree in writing or a degree in film makes you good at that at all. As a matter of fact, I've gone in to like UMass Boston. I was there earlier this year and the woman, she has a PhD in film, critical film studies. And you go in there and it's just really funny. You know, you're coming at it from the street and they're coming at it from eight miles high. And they're really more interested in your, in your opinion because you've seen it all. At, at sort of you know ground zero, um, whereas they're looking at it years in advance. They're looking at what you're writing or what he's writing, what we're all writing, and taking that apart, and then looking at this even bigger historical context, which probably would make a lot of people's uh, eyes in this room just go dry. Um, so, <laughs> depending anyway. on how it's done, though, I mean, like uh, like you said before, uh, I guess I guess it was Ty brought up context. I mean, context right. is everything. Uh, you know. It, as Ali could attest, as far as my classes, I'm, I was, I've always was students saying, dig deeper, dig deeper. Mm -hmm. You know, this is important stuff. It's, uh, uh, I mean, one of the th reasons I think of why all, all of us do this is because it's not, we don't think of movies as something, and I doubt you do either, otherwise I don't think you'd be at a film festival. We demand more than just, oh, it washes over us and then it's over and we don't think about it. It, it should be a, um, a you know, it, it's two hours of your time, it should have meaning. There should be something more than just it happened and it's over. And it can be something light like duck soup, but still there's something that, that, that uh, you know, whether it's uh, that sense of, of anarchy or, or uh, you know, I mean, a rebellion. <laughs> there's something deeper. And, and to sort of push to find that, that's context where I don't think it should be boring, where, you know, um, you can still get people to think about. Oh what no, no, seeing. I was I was talking the academics. No, stuff. I know. When they get these books, they're just. I mean, they're interesting if you're interested. In yeah, them. right, right. You're not going to like. I'll, I'll. Somebody made a great. Uh, does anybody read Anthony Lane in the New Yorker? Yeah. Um, so he's a wonderful. I, 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 I'm going to just say I think he's a wonderful writer. But I was actually at Emerson talking with another film critic, and they said, you know what, Anthony Lane is a great writer, but he doesn't seem like a guy who really loves films. He likes writing about uh, films. I said that. You said that. That no. was me. Well, then, some, <laughs> then Sean Burns stole that from you. Sean, no, okay. Oh, he did. Oh, okay. So, anyways, I, <laughs> but anyways, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> But he, you, I didn't get it from you. I got okay. it from somebody else who well, probably got it from a who shared was opinion. you. It's, it's a shared opinion. Let's put it that way. I love Anthony there, Wayne. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> but okay, so there we go. So it's so in other words, he's using he's taking the art form of of writing a film review and turning it into something sort of joyous for your eyes. But I don't know if I'd go on his opinions because it's like, hey, look at this. Look at this tracking shot I just did. Mm. The movie, pay no attention to the subject matter, but this tracking shot is wonderful. Well, you know, if I can jump in here, I mean, I just referenced Anthony Lane's in a column I wrote about panning, about writing negative reviews. Um, his pan of the uh, Star Wars movie, the third of the middle trilogy, which it was that, which one is that? No, 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 the no, 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 Phantom Menace? Uh, Phantom Menace, Phantom Menace. All right, he, You should it? look it up, you should Google Anthony Lane, Phantom Menace. A, it is one of the most hilarious disembowelings oh, of a movie one? that I've ever read in my life. It's, it's just as, as sheer entertainment. It's just paralyzingly funny. But he gets in some points that reverberate about why this movie and this kind of movie um, does not offer us the sort of cultural and, and, and dramatic nutrition that we need. Um, he talks about how it's bloodless, how you know people get killed, but there's no blood, there's no sweat, there's no air in it. Uh, he's able to write something that's effortless, 
endlessly entertaining and yet make some very trenchant yeah, points. Yeah. And that's a tricky thing, especially, and, and you know, you're, you're talking about how we love to write about movies that mean something. So much of what we have to cover are movies that don't mean anything Formulaic, at all. Yeah. And some of them are dreadful. And some of them, like Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, or The New Mission Impossible, are kind of fun, or yeah. great fun, or yeah. very well done. Yeah. So how do you, you know, how do you, you slalom through that particular field? There's, there's nothing worse than having to write a film review about something you're apathetic about. Right, absolutely. That is the yeah. worst type of film. And as a matter of fact, when I get something like that, I'm like, okay, how can, so I've written for kind of NPR, the Boston Phoenix, fairly liberal leaning publications, so, and, I would say I lean the same way. So I'm like, okay, what's going on in the world? Can I make this about Trump? You know, somehow, <laughs> you know, have fun with it. And I think that Anthony Lane one that you were talking about, is that the one where he does it in the Yoda voice? He writes yes. part of it. He does, he does have to review in Yoda, in Yoda speak. No, he doesn't have to do, but he does, pardon the expression, he does yeah. get upset about Yoda and he coins the deathless phrase, break me a fucking give. <laughs> yeah, 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 there we go. Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, well, you have like you also have like people like Armin White, who yes. I tend to read a lot, and I just think he hates the world, not just film, and yeah. it sort of translates <laughs> into his reviews, where it's like, wow, either he's unhappy in life, or, or <laughs> so you can just tell, like you know, you can just tell the overall. Um, negativity and I've met him he's just like that yes, he's, like, yeah. he's just like that and you're putting your degree to work right now yeah. oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's, just, he's just like that and but one of the things about making reviews entertaining I feel like that's one of the biggest things about writing for a younger generation yeah. is like they have to be entertained or your review has to be under 500 500 words or less or they won't continue to read on right. so you have to find an angle and really make it interesting. Um, because for some reason, they, the younger generation really consumes negative reviews, but positive ones are a little tricky and you have to add a little bit more verbiage and ang angles to it to get people to be interested. Uh, I don't know why that is yet, but people, like when I write negative reviews, they do so much better than when I write well, positive I, ones. I think it's a factor of the social media age where you know you can write a sick burn and it'll just, It'll be, it'll be fun to quote. It's the reason I wrote this column about where I, you know, it's a summer column. I recycled some of my, my pans um, because they're fun to read, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they're fun to quote. Whereas a positive, you know, yeah, it says something about us as human beings. A positive review isn't, doesn't go around the internet nearly as fast, mm -hmm. um, which is sad. I actually am John more to positive reviews, though. Good. Like, I feel like, because I don't want to read a critic who sounds like they're not they went into the film expecting to hate it. Right. So when I re read something by somebody who like just obviously was head over heels in love with the film, it makes me that much more excited to go see it. Where sometimes if somebody vehemently like hates the film, I'm curious and I kind of want to go see it myself. Yeah. I'm not sure if I trust it. Right. Well, <laughs> and somebody I also starts like off with a vent, more. like I I don't like Tom Cruise, and then continues yeah. on. Yeah. If they say I don't like Tom Cruise and then loves the movie, I'll go with that critic. But if they're just like I don't like this director, I don't like this yeah. actor. Yeah. It's like well, this film know. wasn't for you in the yeah. first place. So why are you really writing about it? Exactly. <laughs> but, if you, but if you say why, then you're providing enough context for yeah. the the reader then to make their own decision. Well, I like Tom Cruise, so, so I, the, you know, that's an interesting point, but I disagree with him. Like, I, what I hear all the time, way too much probably, is people will come up to me and they think they're insulting me by saying, you know, I read your reviews, and if you love a movie, I know I'm going to hate it, and if you hate it, I know I'm going to love it. <laughs> yeah, we all get and that. And I'm like, well, you know, great, I'm, I'm providing a valuable service for you then. <laughs> nope. You know, if, if I love a movie, by all means, don't go see it. And, and, and I'm not insulted by it, though, because that is part of it. We're not... I mean, we're supposed to um, state our case as far as why we love a movie, but it's not. I'm not insulted if somebody else has different taste. I mean, or you know, or yeah. a different world well, view. Here's the thing, you know, you can't be a, a critic for everybody. You're right. going, you're going, you're right. going to have the natural audience. People are going to find you out, and if. I, I think most of us, when we use critics, we have like three or four go-tos, and we triangulate our tastes off of them. Um, and if you go to Rotten Tomatoes or Metacritic, you can find any kind of critic to match your tastes, yeah. and hopefully find one or two who challenge you and push you to go check something out. But there's enough, there are enough viewpoints out there 
I mean, it really is. Everybody's a critic at yeah. this point, and everybody can get published. That you can find that you don't have to read you. You don't have to read me if we disagree all the time. Um, you know, I, hopefully you get out of your bubble a little bit. One of the things you you guys are talking about that I think is interesting is that um, you're touching on the negativity in reviews that gets out there, and, and that I think is a, a function of something that's really happened in the last 15 years as the internet matured, which is the ri rise of, of of fan criticism and the fanboy audience. Um, and that goes hand in hand with the rise of these um, big franchise corporate entertainment films. Um, they, they, you know, the Marvel superhero comics movies, which, uh, and, and the Star Wars movies and other movies like them that have devoted fan bases. And there's a wing of, a uh, large wing of internet film coverage um, devoted to that. And, devoted to what they call fan service, and sometimes it can turn against the filmmakers, as in the most recent Star Wars movie, um, where it was, you know, the movie was not deemed Star Wars-like enough, and there's actually an initiative out there by some fans to remake it. They're trying to raise movie to remake the last Star Wars movie so that it's more bro enough, I think. <laughs> um, but how do you guys differentiate between what those people do and what we do, and do you? <laughs> yeah. Um, between you mean like people who are just writing negative reviews for the sake of it? Between, or kind of between the, the fans, the people who are devoted to writing about these things from a fan's perspective, aside from, uh, as distinct from writing about it uh, from a critical perspective. Harvey, what was that guy, Harry Knowles? Remember oh, yeah, he well, he was the founder. He, well, yeah, he was the, the founder of that wing of. I think part of it is just that if you're only goal is to write about like a niche group of films mm -hmm. and that you're a fan first but you want everybody to hear what you have to say about it mm -hmm. rather than being somebody who really loves to write and watch films and kind of merge the two art forms together i think that kind of differentiates the two but also i mean it's the whole like hot take culture or whatever you know everybody just wants to have the buzziest tweet right and like <laughs> that can kind of make up for like a review that's okay um but i don't know if i just I just don't come across it enough in what in like the websites that I write for. Mm -hmm. So, and I try to avoid that right. a lot because I find it really aggravating. Um, but yeah, I think it's mainly the intent because I think a lot of people right. when they write those reviews, they're going into the film hoping they don't like it. And in that case, why are you doing it? Right. You know, mm -hmm. if you're writing about film, I would really hope that every time you go to a movie, you're hoping it'll surprise you and you'll love it. Even if you watch a trailer, you're like, this is going to be everything yeah. I hate. <laughs> well, but I think, I think when you go into a movie, I mean, I think that's one thing that I get a little upset when people go in with a flavor. I like to see somebody that's coming and saying, I'm looking at this objectively right. as a story, yeah. as a narrative, you know, on, on its, and also looking at the film on its terms, regardless of, you know, I love every film that, that you know, Ron Howard makes. I, just, I don't know why I just chose him. I don't. Why not? <laughs> well, just because we were on the Star Wars. The, I was, the, the other directors I was going to pick are all dead. But um, anyways, um, but, but, you know, like, you, you love something, and you should be prepared to go in and even look at that artist's work in an objective way and say, you know, hey, this wasn't your best go round and do writing the criticism that is, I think your criticism has to be like a level across, you know, your opinions and stuff. And if you go in uh, prejudice, you're just doing yourself and your audience a disservice. Well, I think that a lot of those, those fan service critics, they, those reviews lack nuance. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't provide a point of discussion. It's just their opinion and they want you to know about it, and they don't care what you have to say, and that's that. The, there's, the, the reviews are not, they don't open up to any discussion. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. It's just, you know, somebody shouting at us what they think and what they think should or shouldn't happen, and, and that's it, and that's what I tend to stay away from. Uh, that sort of demographic is populated by uh, young white males mm -hmm. who, um, who have a hard time projecting themselves onto characters that do not look like them. Mm. Uh, but we, but everybody else, should be able to take it the other way around. And that's, that, that sort of demographic is very rigid, and it's, it's toxic, and I stay away from it, because there's no, they don't want to engage in a discussion with you. They want to argue with you because they just want to be right. They don't want to just argue. And they want to tell you how they're right and how your opinion's invalid. How your right. opinion's because invalid. Because you're wrong. Right, for whatever reason. Right. And I think that it hurts films like 
Hidden Figures or Sorry mm -hmm. to Bother You or films like that because they can't identify with it, so they skip it. Or if and they that's, choose that's the great thing about movies is it allows you to identify with people that you don't normally identify with. Right, right, right. But, but they, 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 yes. they don't identify it with it, so they skip it. Or they see it and then they complain that they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. But they're not opening themselves up to a conversation to learn more. And that's where the problem is. They're not, mm -hmm. they don't want to have a discussion. They don't want to learn. They just want you to know how they feel, mm -hmm. and you can't get a word in edgewise. That's called ignorance. Like, because my, my block list on social media is so long, it's like a scroll. <laughs> like, you open it up, and it's like so many people, it's like so many people that just want to argue with me. Because, mm -hmm. for example... Um, I want to read your stuff now. <laughs> for, for example, like, it seems like every year I have a film that gets me death threats. Um, part of that is probably because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. Part of that is probably because I'm also a black woman. Mm -hmm. But um, you, you know, you the, actually get death threats. Yeah, people. Just because people don't share my opinion, I yeah. just die and. Yeah. How dare you? Yeah. How dare you not like La La Land? Because I didn't. And what? Um, yeah. Uh, because I didn't. And I wrote this review, and I mean, people went nuts. They thought I should burn and and choke in the fire. Like it was, it was like, it was, I thought it was hilarious because it's just a bunch of empty, you know, empty threats and yeah. people behind keyboards. They, they're not ready to pull up. So, um, and then um, 2007 was, uh, 2017 was the Florida project. Mm. People told me that I, I couldn't be taken, I shouldn't be taken seriously because I don't know what film was about and blah, blah, blah. And it's just, anytime I disagree with something that's the status quo, uh, I get, you know, I don't know what it's gonna be this year, we'll see. Yeah, I didn't like them, you give that movie a negative review? I did not like the Florida Project. Um, and I continue those reviews, I can, you know, because there's a reason why, mm -hmm. and I talk about why. This year I haven't figured out, I haven't figured out what it's gonna be yet. I'm not yeah. looking for it, but, and I don't go into films like, oh, everybody loves this, I'm gonna hate it. Yeah. I don't go into that at all. I go into all films with, even like stuff like Fast and the Furious, I go in with high expectations mm -hmm. for that genre, yeah. and then I look to see if it's done well. Yeah. That's just my motto, I don't care if, you want to do the same thing over and over. Just what is it about the film that makes it different from everything else? And is it done well? That, yeah. That's it. That's the bottom line. You know, I, I, one of the things I always say is I go into every movie and I spend the first 10 minutes trying to figure out what kind of movie are you wanting to be? And then I try and gauge, rate it against the best movie it's, it wants mm. to be. Mm. You know, and every movie it's its own has yeah. its own ideal, yeah. you know, and you have to let it try and rise to that yeah. idea. Like the Mission Impossible films, it's all the same plot. Every single film is the <laughs> yeah. same exact but plot, but it's done well. <laughs> right. So yeah. it's fine for me. Different yeah. stunts, um, same plot. Different stunts, They're same like Jackie plot. Chan films. You right. go in there, watch Tom Cruise right. run and run and run and run and do his own <laughs> stunts. Just like you watch Jackie Chan. But the stunts are the plot. Yeah. It is, exactly. Yeah. Right. And it's, so what if it's like the third act is 45 minutes and there's 15 minutes on the doomsday clock? <laughs> That's totally fine, but that's what you yeah. go in and you expect. Sure, I think it's hokey and silly, but the film is still well yep. done. Yep. Um, and I, I think that that's where the conversation with the fan service stuff gets lost. Yeah. You know, in translation. I, I think we somehow went from fanboys to trolls, but yeah. and that's There's fine. A thin but, line. It's, yeah. a, <laughs> it's a rabbit hole. I, I would totally agree with you, but but the thing is, I think that the fanboys do the stuff that Ty was talking about, that sort of uh, create those movements, and people do take them serious, even though they aver themselves to be correct and nobody else is wrong, yeah. and thus the sort of the spin back on the. Uh, on solo film. The one thing though that you brought up that you said that people wouldn't go see uh, Pardon, uh, Excuse My Interruption or wh whichever films you were talking about. Sorry, sorry, to, bother you. You. sorry <laughs> to bother you. Yes. Uh, the, um, the, the, one, the, one, the one thing about film that you touched upon there is that, pe that people go and see films about different experiences and uh, documentaries and things that take place in foreign lands or different times. Uh, different r classes and all that stuff. It opens up your world. You learn things. You all of a sudden you walk out. You're like, I need to go learn about that period of history. Did that really happen in that country? I mean, it just really opens up people's minds. And I think when people shut down just on the subject matter, I mean, they're, they're just being ignorant. I mean, I think uh, cinema is a way to see the world uh, from your living room if you don't have the time or means to travel anywhere else. Um, so I just think for people that are doing that, your response to them be like, open your eyes, go see the movie, right. and then once you see the movie, tell me I'm wrong. Well, see, that's the thing, it's like, the internet is free, right, for now. <laughs> um, and, but people don't want to do the work, they want me to do all the work, and I 
I, I spend enough time writing a thousand words on reviews. Well, what like, work? What work? I mean, context. I mean, part of my work is context is explaining stuff for what? them and allowing them to sort of situate a film within a framework so that they understand what it's going to. Well, of that course. For the review too, right? Right. It's like they don't get your opinion. They're like, okay, well, why oh, don't you teach okay. me? everything that I'm wrong about. And right. it's like, well, why don't you go and learn and listen? Right, or right. just read the review. <laughs> like, just, you know, or they'll read my review and they'll be like, I want more. I'm like, well, what, where, here's some links where you can get more and um, <laughs> go for it. But then they're like, no, I want you to tell me this because you're obligated because this is your job. And I'm like, wait, I've done my job. Well, can you give an example of that? Um, I know what she's talking about. It's happened yeah. to me. You get a, re a reader who responds who really wants you to write a second review, uh, write another 500 uh, words to 1,000 yeah, words yeah, yeah. on a one-on-one -on -one engagement, which maybe it's okay if it's one of your friends and you're hanging yeah, around yeah. having that's beers different, and right. stuff like that. But when you've got a bunch of reviews, you know, when you're, yeah. you're, you're writing deadline, that's not part of the it's job. It's almost yeah. like they're waiting for you to trip up so yes. they can be like, actually, uh, you're wrong. Right. Uh, there you go. That's we it. we it the whole time. Uh, that's well, it. So well, you not, should, yeah. should say, here's how much you get paid. Pay me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I wish I was paid that much. Yeah, well, uh, make, right. up a, make up a number and then triple it. <laughs> just triple the numbers. Can I talk about something, though, I mean, just sort of pursuant to what you said and just knowing your situation where you're working as an IT person during the day and writing at night. I mean, you've got two different generations of movie criticism here on stage, and they're profoundly different. And I'm the dinosaur in the room, and you're the dinosaur, no offense. And you're, you're, you're a young dinosaur, but you're a dinosaur. <laughs> I'm a velociraptor. Um, you, know, I'm, I, you know, I am a paid film critic on staff at a major metropolitan daily. There are fewer and fewer of us around. That's how stuff was done in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Really, you know, once they took it away from the lady who wrote The Garden, column, you know, back in the 1940s, and, and dedicated film critics started doing it. Um, and that was the model up until the rise, the rise of the internet, um, which has changed the economic model of everything, um, as well as the information gathering model. And so many of the younger critics I follow on Twitter and online, uh, which include, you know, people like these guys, they, they can't get a job like mine anymore, because yeah. um, there are fewer and fewer outlets. And the reality is, and it kind of amazes me that you guys are able to do this, is they're, they're writing for, you know, they're multi-gig, it's like a gig economy. You're writing for a bunch of different outlets. Uh, you often have to have day jobs. Very few people I know who are doing or it two. seriously. <laughs> what? Right. I said, or two. Or two, um, who are doing it seriously in your generation that don't have day jobs or are able to, it's just, I, 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 my hat goes off to you, to you guys. I mean, it's a totally different uh, model of, of the business than the one yeah. that I have. You wouldn't believe what some of these outlets pay. Like, I guess it's- If what, they do. If they pay if at they all. Because yeah. right. what, what, what has happened is like, first, first of all, the New York Times just laid off like 120 people. Yeah. It's just, the, this it is a bubble that has burst. And a lot of that I think is due to social media and YouTube where anybody can be a critic and get paid, you know, on a platform or whatever, you know, starting websites is free now. Anybody can go and like publish their opinion. There's no exclusivity anymore. And so a lot of outlets have found it cheaper to just fire their writing staff and then pay freelancers right. $50 here, $75 there. You wouldn't believe some of the huge conglomerate outlets that pay less than $100 and they want a thousand words from you. It's absolutely insane. I don't yeah. want to throw anybody out. I, I don't know how you do it. I did an outlet you, that was under $30 a piece. Yeah, <laughs> look, but I was they, like, they, this is amazing. They pay I'm getting paid. <laughs> Some insane. <laughs> and when you stir. Yeah, right. it was and, wonderful. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I can't, I've never been able to eat from exposure. Like, yeah. I can die of exposure, yeah, right. but I've never been able to eat yeah. off of just exposure from one outlet to the next. Right. Yeah. So the thing is, like, I've had to cut down on a lot of websites because I have to, you know, I want to reserve my energy and my time because I have a day job and things like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a difficult market to navigate, especially for, for, for a woman, especially for uh, people of color and women of color. It's mm -hmm. been extremely difficult to navigate because especially at the film festivals, for example, uh, when I met Judy, I was there on a, on a job, but I knew several women, especially who were not attached to outlets, who just went because they thought they could gather you know, coverage, and then when they got back home, they couldn't recoup any losses from the right. trip because they send all their white male staff to the, the film festivals. So you don't need work from us. Mm -hmm. So you'll find less and less uh, demo niche demographics at film festivals because they have no money to go yes. to these things. I will say that in the past, I've seen a change in the, in, over the past 10 years. 10 years ago, nobody was getting paid at all. 
now they're paying thirty dollars or fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's starting to change, and they're also I have noticed, and maybe you can tell me I'm being I don't know, over optimistic here. Um, a greater number of of um, of websites devoted to film writing, Ebert.com has really broadened its yeah. sphere. Uh, Bright Wall, Dark Room, Vague Visages are two that pop to mind. I'm sure there are plenty of others. Um, so there are outlets. Do they pay? Some yeah. of them. Yeah. Not some well. Them. Yes, not well. <laughs> if they pay at all. And there's some that pop up like Pace Magazine or The Rap, or the rap yeah. and they live for a while and then they yeah. sort of, and then the next thing comes along. But uh, just about the state of film criticism, I mean, God, 10, maybe it was 20 years ago, every every local news station had an entertainment right. reporter. Right. The entertainment, Joyce Cole yeah, right. or, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Love her very much. Um, but, you know, that's all gone. Yeah. Um, you know, it was funny when I was writing at the Phoenix and the internet came along and it started to erode its business. I thought, wow, the internet's going to be great. I will have more space to write because disk storage is, is pretty right. cheap. But what they ended up doing was shrinking the paper because yeah. they were cutting yeah. costs. So, yeah. Yeah. And they're like, we're not going to, even if you do it for free, we're not going to bother to edit a longer review. We're just going to keep it nice and small. Yeah. So, And in the Boston Society of Film Critics, we're about uh, something about 22 people. And I would say that probably um, when I joined the group in about 1995, that probably I'd say about half the people worked there had just exclusively were uh, full-time film critics, yeah. I'd say. Now that you, you're going to... No, no, oh, go okay. ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that number now is probably down to less than five yeah. of, wow. of us. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, and that might even be an optimistic yeah. That still sounds number. impressive to me. It, it, well, <laughs> it, but, um, I'll point out that there is also another organization, the uh, Boston Association of Online Film Critics, yeah, Ellison, um, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is which is a different, younger group um, yeah. who are more like these guys, writing for multiple yeah. outlets. Um, so it, you know, we don't represent the only yeah. you know, group of film writers in, in there, the Boston uh, area. I mean, there's always it's always been um, difficult, though, to become a film critic. Like you, you have beaten the the odds. Uh, I mean, even. For example, when I started, I had a handful of privileges. Let's put it that well, way. Well, but uh, but you, I mean, but clearly, I mean, look at how many how many people are in the sports staff of the Globe. Lots. Yeah. Yeah. And how many film critics? One. Yeah. <laughs> and even even if you go twenty years ago, maybe there were two. Uh, well, when I, when I was hired, I was hired along um, with Wesley, with Wesley yeah. Morris, who's over at the Times now, and actually we replaced Jay Carr, yeah. who was very adamant about being the only yeah. film critic Full at that time. paper for yeah. 25 years. Turf, sure. Yeah, but uh, how many? I mean, there used to, I used to hear about there being like 35 uh, sports writers sure. or, on staff. So <laughs> it's always been very, very difficult, especially to to work for a major metro paper. Mm -hmm. um, but when I start, I started by I was covering three sports teams for five dollars a crack and uh and a movie review for ten dollars <clears> a week <throat> so for a weekly in plymouth so i was getting paid 25 dollars a week for covering three high school sports teams <laughs> and and ten dollars for the review yeah. you know and and uh and then uh, as far i mean my career because i kind of based it on i wanted to live on the cape and raise my kids here um, you know, I, I'm the features editor now. I, you know, I got on the daily as a copy editor. I've always been the reviewer. I was sports arts features editor for a weekly. So, and if somebody asked me, why are you doing that? So I can write movie reviews. Right. You know? <laughs> so there always has been that. Uh, and that's not to say, well, geez, it's, it's not so bad now. Or, you know, it's when I hear of how many jobs you're working, Allie, I mean, I love that in a way That's because it shows your passion, but it is sad that, you know, I think we all uh, have had to, you know, work really hard to do what we love. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's so much more than just a fun job. But I also think it's what's both heartening and kind of disheartening for me is the, the struggle you, your guys and your peers are going through is that we need strong critical voices out there to get people to engage critically, not just as fans or not just as reactors, but yeah. to engage critically with the culture in which we swim, the popular culture in which we swim, and that it's harder to hear those voices for all the noise. Yeah. Yeah. And I always yes. think of like when I go to when I go to a film festival and I go to Sundance, one of the, th the things that always strikes me and kind of just freaks me out is as soon as the credits hit, 
I can see every phone yeah. light up yeah. as everybody goes to Twitter to just go blah, 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 yeah. and put it out there. You yeah. know, there's a, you know, there's a million points of snarky light, if you will. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, how many of those voices are measured and bringing context? And how many, you know, I hate to bring it, but how many voices are worth it? You know, are really yeah. bring something extra to the table, and that's what you know our challenge as writers. But your guys' challenge as readers to find them, and how do we but, how do we meet? But well, I mean, I think content out on the internet or in this day of social media. I mean, even just films. I mean, God, you know, iTunes. You know, the stuff that's not being re released is just over. I think again, you know, I mean, you're at the Globe, uh, so. It's a respected paper, so it's got to. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just saying is you know there are there are these <laughs> the New York Times. What I'm just saying is there's going to be these things, and then it's up to these other new uh, uh, facilities that come up. You know, like you were talking about uh, uh, Ebert.com. Right. You know, and they come out. And if, originally, that that site is morphed a, a bunch since you know. Uh, Roger's uh, death. Well, it's not being run by his widow. Right, Chaz. exactly, Chaz. Right. Yeah, and and I'm just saying is is that those things then become there's another one called Empire. I think is a new one. That's there's there's a bunch of them, and they sort of gain credibility, mm -hmm. and then the the people that are writing for them gain that credibility and get the voice. And I think that's always going to be changing. I mean, there's going to be the stalwarts, and then the new ones, and I think it's just movies that get put out or or ebooks that get put out onto to the Amazon cloud or or the iTunes cloud, it's, you know, the quality will, you know, obviously pimping it always helps in getting people there, but I, I think, you know, the quality will raise to the surface eventually. Well, I think w w what's also happened, though, with the advent of, of the internet, it, it, there's a culture of, um, uh, what do they call it, um, aggregating? Yes. yes. Where people are Rotten just tomatoes. writing things mm. to get views on the internet yeah, and there's no quality there because they just it's just a bunch of keywords in there. Yeah, yeah. and that really that has sort of hurt a lot of reviewing and writing. I've had people email me asking specifically to write for us because they know we're on Rotten Tomatoes, and that's the only reason they oh, want to write. Wow. wow. And then you know I get to say no. You get to, but, <laughs> see, but see the other thing. Well, like, I'm, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, well there is that thing about manufacturing. Um, um, manu the studios and people behind the product also manufacturing opinion. Um, they have, I know, I know when I wrote for the Phoenix, and I'm sure NPR wouldn't do this at all, uh, and I know the Globe won't do it, we don't go to junkets because, yeah. you know, yeah. the studio wants, and the people who go to these junkets are people who probably write these little blurby, terrible reviews, and they go out there, they get wined and dined. And right. they, they get flown out, put up. I've uh, got to meet the, 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 the directors and the actors, and... And you guys wouldn't do that? No. We're, well, we're not allowed, generally, the publication. <laughs> we, you guys are really settled. We, well, <laughs> well, well, I think the Globe has a policy against it. I mean, just oh, yeah. because it's journalistic integrity. Well, I do know that when we had, and it's changed now that because we've got less of a head count, but certainly when I was at Entertainment Weekly and when we had two critics at the Globe, if you're writing the feature, when you're interviewing the director and the actors, you do not write the review, right. oh, and vice versa, oh, okay. because... It's, it's almost famous all over again. Yeah. They are not your friends, yeah, but right. you want them yeah, to be your friends. Yeah, yeah. It, right. it, gets, it, it skews the review. Yeah. There was, yeah. skews the critical there was that great story. Remember, it was, so there was this, uh, somebody made up a newspaper in Ridgefield, Connecticut yes. Yes. That, that manufactured oh, quotes right. for Sony. I forget the guy's yeah. name. And yeah, it was Sony made up a fake film. A fake right. film and a fake newspaper. To, to write blurbs. <laughs> yeah. But by the way, one of the things that I always get asked, and it's really weird, um, is do, do the studios ever like try and pay me? You know, to write, and no, it's never happened, not once, no. not even close, yeah. it's just not Well, like even. in the fanboy culture where everybody thinks we're being paid by Marvel to write yeah, great yeah. reviews. Yeah. Right, and we're being, you know, yeah, and DC doesn't pay us enough. Right, right. yeah, right. it's the same but thing. It, but, it, but there is that gray area of... I'm uh, open for business, DC. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but next time you see in the newspaper, like, all those great one-liner blurbs, yeah. look at the publication of yeah. a person's name, yeah. and see of, of the 15 blurbs that are there, you may be going to know one person who actually did like the film and they actually mind it and from it. And see if the review itself is actually positive. <laughs> or, I've had see, that or see if it's the same person every time, every movie that right. said yeah. there are 10 critics, plus it's the A joyride. <laughs> joyride of the summer. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are critics, we call them blurb whores. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's definitely you, a, a gray area, uh, well, in journalism in general, but also it, with this where 
like, uh, like Ebert, I remember reading, uh, he had interviewed Jane Fonda, and then there was some, I think it was called The Morning After or something, it was about her being an alcoholic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I didn't think it was that great of a movie, and he had interviewed her, and then his review came out the day later of the movie, and it was very positive, yeah. and I did think, you know, well, but I And you know, I've even if it's not true, yeah. that impression yeah. is given, and so, that's another yeah. reason we don't, you know, yeah. just for the impression yeah. that you are able to remain critically, yeah. um, uh, you know, objective. <laughs> There's no such thing as, right. as there is objectivity. No, yeah. That's the other thing I hear is like, you know, why can't you be objective? Yeah. There's no such thing as there, objective. Yeah. There it's is always one person here subjective who's subjective. Uh, it's, yeah, we all bring in our personal right. histories and perspectives on things. Yeah. But it's, it's subjective just... opinion surrounded by objective context. That's what I think. <laughs> so, yeah. so, 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 Valerie, you do know that Ebert started off as a screenwriter and then became a film critic, right? I didn't know that. Oh, um, Valley. Yeah. I don't was know. It Valley of the Dolls? Beyond the Valley, Valley of the Dolls. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond the Valley yeah. of the Dolls with the deathless <laughs> line of, uh, what's the deathless <laughs> line from it? It's my happening and it's freaking me out. <laughs> I didn't know that. I know that now. Yeah. Oh, it's one of the worst uh, movies ever made. Uh, Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Uh, do you find that you get like a lot of pushback from other critics? Like, because that's the thing that's happening to me now is like I'm butting heads with other critics who feel like I shouldn't be, like I don't deserve to be in the space. Um, I know I started, I guess it's been happening for a while, but I really started to notice it when um, Catherine Bigelow's Detroit came out. Mm. And there was just a. Do you have problems with that movie? Yes. Yeah. Actually, I uh, love that a, a better example is Birth of a Nation. Mm. And I noticed that. Uh, when it was when it premiered at Sundance, it received you know a standing ovation, but the majority of the audience was white. That was three billboards too, essentially, yeah. right? Was Last it? Year. Yes. Okay. It's yes. Like all the festivals, it's predominantly white people going, mm -hmm. and they loved it. And then it hit the mainstream audiences, and people are like, "Well, people are like, wait, what? There's uh, some issues. Like, there's address. some issues, and I'm finding that now where I'm 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 seeing films after everybody else sees them, and I'm like, I'm like wait, wait, what is everybody seeing that I'm not seeing? Because this is what I saw, okay. and here's my perspective. Okay, I'm going to tell you something. I've been in this business a long time, um, and I'm going to say this about other critics who are giving you grief. Um, pardon, cover your ears if you're, uh, fuck them. Exactly. Um, your exactly. opinion is your opinion. Express your opinion. I, I, I know that when I come out of screenings at the Boston Common, Every night there's a group of critics that hang out and sort of throw their best lines at each other. And, and yeah. I understand it's sort of a valuable <laughs> thing if you're sort of testing out your, your stuff. Um, and it's a bit of a, comp, it's a, bit of a, a uh, competition. And, and some people really enjoy that and I don't. It's mm -hmm. just not. I just think the difference might be is that we might get labeled difficult. Yes. <laughs> if we just say screw them. Yes. Whatever. Yeah. And I think that could be part of I mean, it, too. Is that if but you should say it to yourself. I do, oh, yeah, and I say sure. it to them, too, sometimes. Yeah, like, sure. Sometimes no, but, I'm like... Know, keep, keep, keep that pride in your opinion. You know? and, uh, but, but I, I think we need that pushback sometimes, where it's like you, you see everybody all of a sudden, like for Detroit, that was one of the scariest movies ever because everybody was loving it. I was like, did I miss something huge? Because I didn't like it. Mm. Right. So I put that out there, but yeah, no, I see similar... Maybe not as much, but I see some more. Well, there's a, there, and, and there is a crowd effect with, um, among critics, yeah. which is one reason I do not read, and I'd be curious to hear how you guys do this, I don't read any reviews of a movie that I'm reviewing before I write my review. Right. I don't I, go anywhere. And that's also right. the reason I walk out of the movie. I mean, you and I are probably the two beeliners out of it. I just, yeah. I don't like talking about the film right. so, yeah. so much. Because also, too, I'm trying to collect my mind around the right. whole thing, too. And, and I try to not... Um, uh, adulterate myself beforehand with that. So it's impossible to do. I mean, you're going to see stuff on TV, but... Um, and one of the things that happens when you come out of a screening, if it's a, public, a, a press screening or a publicity screening, is that the press rep for the studio oh, yeah. will you button all you, what you think, yeah. what you think, what you think. And some people love to... And because uh, then the press rep will go back to the studio marketers and say, well, they, you know, they really liked it or they didn't like it or here's what so-and-so from this outlet said. Um, and the marketers then use that often. Sometimes will even change their release strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't. I don't. I won't do it. I just say it's good no matter what. I just say good. I just go. It's good. It's good. Yeah. It's good. Um, it's fine. Well, because that's what happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah just, I, I just don't want to be part of the marketing strategy. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happened with Annihilation. Like uh -huh. uh, um, earlier in the year, they had because I lived in Sacramento for a while, and they had did uh, screenings in Sacramento in 2017. And they did screenings for the public, and then they did screenings for press. Right. And it changed the whole demographic of the movie. Yeah. Um, wow. and so what we see is completely different from what people saw last year. 
Well, so I try not they to. Thought it was too talky. Yeah. So, so they, there's they, a difference. They, they made a, so you saw an early cut. I didn't see it, but other people saw it, test and they screen. said that they see. They right, said yeah. that they saw people that saw it twice. That saw that test yeah. screening and saw that. So the movies are completely and that's, different. And that's something that's been going on for a long. Yeah. Test screening. Oh yeah, that gets back. Well, yeah, I know way, test screening is different, but you know, I'm just saying that that's that's an example where it can change. Like you know, when you talk to someone, it can change the entirety of the movie. Um, when you sit, because you know, publicists are out there listening to the little group and hearing, you know, what people are saying, and they're writing it down even if they don't Absolutely. ask you directly. Well, there's so. events that shape how a movie comes out as well. I mean, Serendipity, that movie with Kate Beckinsale mm -hmm. and and uh, John and John Cusack. Yeah, they had to. It was around the time 9/11 happened, so they had to remove the opening bit of the tower and then move the opening of the film out a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen. Like, what was the other film that got delayed uh, a big period of time? Um, it was Arnold Schwarzenegger. 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 I forget the name of the movie, but it was a Schwarzenegger film um, that was, you know, basically, you know, destroying Skyscraper's movie right after 9-11. And right. I remember I was at Entertainment, Entertainment Weekly then. And I, collateral I, damage? Collateral damage. And uh, I remember writing, <laughs> I don't know if I ever want to see another one of these movies ever again. Yeah. And of course, yeah. you know, six months later, I'm watching the world Collateral. get destroyed in some other movie. Yeah. Um, um, as far, one of the things that, that you've mentioned is as far as like, walk, you know, walking out quickly. I always I feel guilty too. walking out quickly. I always I have uh, commute. The screenings. What's that? I have a long drive. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm going to run out. <laughs> yeah, I always feel guilty either, no matter what I do. So. But, um, but I think it's kind of, um, I try and focus on the movie and I try yeah. and like filter. I, I don't watch trailers. Yeah. yeah. Trailer, I hate trailers. Oh, trailers yeah, lie. Away. Trailers, trailers lie. The trailers, trailers exist to get your butts in the seat yeah. and they will misrepresent and sell you whatever. The movie. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I won't watch trailers. Um, I, I don't talk to the reps. I avoid the conversation. I just yeah. want to have yeah. focus on the movie. That's the that's the yeah. issue. And that what you mentioned as far as at film festivals with like after the movie is over and all the lights of the phones. Yeah. I, I wrote a column about that about it in Boston uh -huh. in the screenings where you see it too where the the line of and. You know, I, I feel like that guy, you know, get off my lawn, the old guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm thinking, where is the reflective thinking yeah. if, if people are just doing their gut, you know, writing their gut reaction? I mean, where you're talking about where you want to just leave and think about it. I mean, I'm still discovering things as I'm writing the review. Sometimes yeah. it will go down or up a little bit as I, oh, wait a minute, you know, and, and you, you wrestle with it. And it's, it's reflective thinking. And there's no reflective thinking if it's just, you know, regurgitating some opinion. Well, you also see a movie too, and then you'll, some, some movies that are uh, more deeper thinking than let's say a Tom Cruise um, uh, Mission Impossible, yeah. but you'll have questions afterwards, and you might do a little research yourself and sort of deepen it. I didn't really know that about this filmmaker that mm. had a credit over here, and all of a sudden it starts to open up the story and you're starting right. to link together. You know, you can see sort of how this Filmmakers experience they were you know whatever a DP on this film. That's yeah, part of that, our job. Yeah, exactly yeah. I, But but and I think that puts a whole different reflection on not a different a great I mean you're gonna have your opinion on the film yeah. But just deepen sort of the way you're going to present your opinion and if you're getting a knee-jerk reaction afterwards that Reflective thinking and that sort of additional research is sort of taken away from you, right? Um, yes, I, I love those additional Connections you can make mm -hmm. you can make for the reader that allows them to sort of Bathe deeper into the experience of the movie. Uh, you know whether it's uh, making a connection with the, the director or actor's previous work or the subject, or you have to fill in those blanks for or, or for films the that sort of cover from historically that similar materials or right. things that have. That, that's one of our jobs, I think. You know, and that's where we're doing the research and having an understanding of cinema history. And, and things that were happening with filmmakers at times and social events that shaped films, shaped filmmakers. You put that stuff in there and you put some references in there. People don't get it. Uh, I mean, not, well, I'm blown away. I'm dazed. I can't get it. But just a reference to a film. It'll make them interest to go look at those films. It was funny. I was writing something here for this, the guide for these films here. And I forget whose film it was. But I made a uh, reference to Michael Henke and um, 
the guy who did Drive, and I put those films in there, and they said, wow, people don't, you know, people are reading this as a guide. And I was like, well, if they don't know those guys and they look at their films, and then they go look up those films and go see those films, isn't that better for them as readers and yeah. film goers? Well, I mean, you're sort of raising the, the issue of where, what place does the past have when you're reviewing stuff of the present? And again, I'd be curious to hear what, what, what you guys um, think of this. I mean, as somebody who grew up in a revival house era, where I was steeping in all these old movies. Um, and part of writing about movies of the present was hopefully not overdoing, you know, we, we've all read reviews where somebody's like referencing some obscure yeah, yeah. movie that doesn't really have bearing on what you're talking about, yeah. but still bringing in points of comparison and, and point, points of influence is important. Um, and I do notice, you know, I, I, I teach a number of film courses and I do notice over the past 10, 15 years that I've been teaching that these students knowledge of past movies has gradually decreased. Um, and I think that the culprit is this, is the thing in the, that yeah. there's so much media coming at them in the now that it's harder <laughs> and for them to take time to investigate the past, which is why I think streaming sites like Filmstruck right. um, and some of the others that you know, round up all these great old films are really, really useful, especially for younger audiences. Right. Um, but where do you guys... Do you feel like you have a responsibility to movies of the past when you're writing about stuff of the present? Yes, yeah, so I feel like there was a discussion about this like Huge a couple of months ago, right? Like yeah. on Twitter. Um, um, but no, I think right. yeah. I think it's like anything. If you know more about the thing you're talking about, you're going to sound more intelligent and people are going to be more engaged. But I also think that for something like film, where not everybody has the luxury of going and taking a lot of intensive film study courses, I think you can kind of learn at your own pace too, and I think that's almost just as interesting sometimes to mm -hmm. be like, because you know, that's kind of my mission this year was to kind of fill in some of those gaps that just by virtue yeah. of not taking enough classes. But no, I do think that you like just for your own sake, for your own writing, you know, the more you know is well, always going to help that. But that's for to, anything. Yeah. <laughs> you have to have an informed opinion if you're going to be a critic. Yeah. You can't just, I mean, just to throw an opinion isn't going to be too valuable without it being an informed opinion. So when you're a young critic, well, how could you have seen everything if you're well, a young you're critic? Well, unless you're Valerie and she was really into <laughs> well, interesting films at a young age. But you're, like, <laughs> I, I started know, 20. I, but I know from some of the things that you've written, you know, that you've, okay, now I'm really jumping, diving into Kurosawa. Right. So it's yeah, like you, you, great. you are yeah. consciously <laughs> doing that and, and you won't just do it for this year you're, yeah. you, because you're going to continue. I'm very like, time oriented, you know, so yeah. you give yourself this year to watch all of his films. Yeah, and yeah, and then it. you move on to someone else. But <laughs> yeah. that's how you do it. I mean, it's, it it's, is it's, you, you know, yeah. it's not like. But you, there's a bit of, I, sometimes I feel like there's a bit of bitterness behind it, at least when for me. When people get, say that you're not well, uh, I, knowledgeable enough. You well, I, I'm try, I try to balance it by not sounding too elitist but mm. yeah. you know giving people the freedom to you know do what they want but also being like okay well there are basics and maybe you you might want to know them before you know whatever but again having an informed opinion is what it is but it seems like there's like this new renaissance of people wanting to watch older films or whatever because it's cool now yeah. just like when i when Thank i was God. growing up and uh, I used to watch a lot of Japanese it. anime and yeah. manga, and people used to throw pennies and screws at me <laughs> and steal my pencils because I used to collect pencils. So I was like a big nerd and wore big glasses and everything. I used to read a lot. And I used to watch Japanese anime all the time, and people said I was, you know, immature as a kid and whatever. And now it's cool because yeah. it's like Dragon Ball Z and there's Naruto, and everybody's like, oh, did you watch this or whatever? I'm like, wow, you know what I had to go through so that you could <laughs> enjoy that? Yeah. So, <laughs> but you did, and you have but, an informed you know, opinion. But, but but, I, but I, you know, I, I don't judge people. I'm glad that they're discovering it now, and I'm glad that they're yeah. having a good time. But sometimes I remember it's like, hmm, like I had to, you know, it, it, watching films is work. Because, for, at least for me, because I've become emotionally invested, and I put everything into my watching experience so that I can get what, you know, what I expect to get out of it, whether I cry or laugh or whatever. Um, so... It, part of it feels like you know there's work to be done, and you know in order to have an informed opinion, you must do the work, and you should yeah. watch. Well, because it's a job, and it never ends. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, it's, it's not like you know when you're a geezer, all of a sudden you stop. I right. still right. have so many gaps that well, I, I would like to fill. I've gotten to the point where I've forgotten a lot of the movies I saw. Yeah, from, me you know, too. Yeah. In the first 30 years of my life, so yeah. I have to go back. Yeah. Um, it's one of the nice things about having kids is that you can watch movies again for the first time. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know. 
One thing I think is important is, yeah, it's, it, it's important to be informed about movies, but it's, it's important to be an effective film critic or to be an effective critic of anything. You have to be informed about everything or as much as you possibly can. You have to read a lot. You have to, um, you know, see a lot of art. You have to experience... As, there's nothing worse than a film critic who only knows movies. Right. You know what I mean? Or there's nothing more narrow. Because right. I feel like, every, you know, we're all writing about life through this filter of the movies as our chosen medium. Um, but it, it's important for me to, to get out there and get as much other art and life in there yeah. as possible. It kind of airs I mean, out the room. That was the knock with the, like, say, you know, the film school guys, right. uh, you know, Spielberg or whoever, where, well, did they experience life? Mm -hmm. Or do they only know movies? And, and that's why, I mean, what, what, like to be a veteran, that's a huge, that, that, to me, that's so much more important as a film critic than, than oh, I have a, a BA in, in, uh, in film studies right. or something like that. Because, <laughs> you know, there, if, if you have in your background something that says, I've lived, so when I can, I can write about life, because that's what films are about. Yep. So, you know, that's pretty much what Ty's saying, I think, too, is, is that. I think in my, in my case, this sometimes hurt me, because then I'm overly critical of military movies. Yeah, but that's <laughs> a really great uh, perspective, and you, we yeah. don't, you don't get that perspective enough. Right. So, yeah. That's Good View. Point. What? That's, that's what we should call your blog. That's, <laughs> that's View. view. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> In the back? Um, so, uh, since I'm the president of Boston Society of Film Critics, I get a lot of people that come through our gateway, and it's just an administrative facility. They're like, how can I get you guys to review the films? I mean, uh, first of all, you should know places that do previews of festivals and solicit them and the people like Ellen here, who are doing the media. Um, I, you know, uh, we don't really, where I write at Cambridge Day, we don't, we don't do stuff for stuff that comes on the streaming platforms. We just do current releases in the theater. So, you know, because we're a news organization geared around a specific geographic area. So I think one of the things is you should figure out how you, the critics that would write about the types of films that you do and cover, you know, maybe festival beats or and that type of thing. I mean, the other thing is get it into a movie. Th I mean, the best way to have a film reviewed is generally a lot of big film um, uh, reviewing right now is tied to theatrical releases. It's a catch twenty two. Um, it's a catch twenty two exactly. I think um, the but, point about knowing the outlet too, because yeah. I know quite a few. And like this isn't just speaking about mine because that's really conceited. But like, <laughs> we tend to try to cover everything we can because our goal is to target younger viewers. Mm -hmm. And my thing specifically also is to try to target young female readers and viewers. So I think just knowing the outlets is important. And because I always think there's like a place for any kind of film. And I think streaming services and short films, I think they're kind of overlooked sometimes. And I think there's a lot of people who are kind of coming, I feel like I've seen a bigger discussion recently about short films. Yep. And so I just, I always think there's an outlet for it, but it's just about knowing who, which isn't really an answer so much as a like, there's more work to be done. <laughs> so I'm sorry. But. I will come out and say it. I don't think the Globe properly covers films the way we watch them. I think the Globe cover, Boston Globe, and me, most mainstream news publications cover only the theatrically released films uh, of feature length. Uh, and we'll you know, do a cursory festival roundup, um, but we don't cover short films. And we don't cover, despite um, some efforts on some people's parts to move us in that direction, we don't cover streaming films, movies that like, may play New York and LA, but only then you know, do same, do what they call day and date appear on streaming, so people in New England can see it the same day, same time. Um, 
we, we don't cover that. We don't cover movies the way people watch them now, and that's a frustration for me, and one that I've been talking about with our editors. And there are some people like the New York Times. Uh, Glenn Kenny is now reviewing as a streaming column every week, and and my. Sunday column about once every couple of months. I do a roundup of streaming films. Mm. Um, I don't really write about short films. I've taught a course on short films. I love short films. That's a whole other conversation about how there's an explosive of, explosion of short content on, on the internet because of YouTube and other places, and Vimeo and all of, all of those outlets. Um, and you're right, we don't write about it. Um, and it's, it's a catch-22, and it's fr as frustrating for me as it is for you. I often feel there um, there's about a hundred times more movies than I can write about, and it's that's opportunity for somebody. what it's an entrepreneurial it is. Opportunity. It absolutely is. Well, the thing, yeah. What would be the business model around that? The obscure roundup. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I mean, it's like pulling the. There, I mean, I, again, but all these I, people have yeah. to have movies. They all need yeah. want them to get seen because yeah. that's why they're making movies. How do you break through that bottleneck? The festival has traditionally been the way out of that bottleneck, but then getting beyond that, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I wish I could offer an easy right answer. There. Just following on that other filmmaker oriented question, there are a lot of films with the distribution model being broken that are finding incredibly big audiences through alternatives. Yes. A couple hundred event theatrical or um, DIYing it and going to groups as well as going releasing straight to iTunes. So I'd love to hear you speak a little more candidly about um, how you think about those films? Do you have hard and fast rules that aren't doing theatrical, but lots of people are talking about them and seeing them? And do you have any obligation or sense of anything to let them know it's coming? To you, it's coming to Hyannis for two weeks. It's going to be shown at a bunch of you know auditoriums or schools or something. So there are opportunities, and so you sort of like a curtain raiser, but it's not theatrical. It's not a festival. It's harder and harder. At the, I'm just speaking about the Globe, where we're losing page counts. Uh, you know, because we've got a new owner and we're we're cutting costs and we're still having buyouts and you know it's it's not a fun economic time to be a major you know, newspaper. So we've lost page counts in the arts section, and that means we can cover less stories. And it means that, for instance, uh, you know, my editor has decided that uh, if a movie is showing at the Apple Cinemas in Cambridge, which is where a lot of sort of um, lesser theatrical product ends up, we're not going to cover it. Um, period. So our hands are tied. There's only so much room that we, in the paper that we can cover. It. So again, it's a catch-22. Um, it's up to the individual writers. It's not just me. It's Peter Keogh, who used to review films for the Boston Phoenix, who now covers documentaries uh, in, in the New England area. It's, um, uh, it's Tom Russo, who's another one of our freelancers, to keep our ears out. And we do, so that when we hear about, um, uh, for instance, there's a movie um, a documentary about the uh, this um, Boston-based music video channel of the 1980s that's getting a runoff at the Coolidge Corner, which I'm probably going to write about for my column next week because um, it's got local interest. So um, you, you have to find the hooks that work. So in this case, it's a local interest, and I know people like reading about you know local stories, but it's. I wish I could be, you know, more optimistic. So, for example, at the Cambridge Day, I'll get guys like I grew up in Cambridge. I went to Harvard or whatever. I've got this horror film that's streaming. Uh, yeah. You know this, and I'll be like, so since it has to do with Cambridge, we'll 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 review that film. We'll we'll do something for it coming to streaming, and we'll it'll be more of a profile about the filmmakers. I'll watch the film, but it's not so much, but it'll put something out there for them. Um, but that's because they did they came directly to the right person in the right venue yeah, for it's such that. A I think um, just people have to search. Um, the good thing about uh, niche, you know, operating within a niche is that uh, you, you realize that there is a demographic and people want that kind of information, sort of like what happened with black girl nerds. There was a demographic out there that wanted to hear news reported by black women. Uh, I think that there are reviewers and, and people out there who do specifically short films or mm -hmm. horror films. Those places exist, you just have to look for it because they may not be mainstream, they may be hard to find. So it requires some work, but I, I'm gonna say that they're out there. I just, I wish I had a better answer as well. I just don't. In the back. Hi. Um, in terms of, there's a sort of gray area now of big budget that films that go straight to Netflix or straight to HBO mm -hmm. or straight to Amazon. Do you review those? Yeah. I mean, I do. I yeah. do. I was like, I do. Yeah, it's like, a film, like Ocha, you know? maybe, or... I can't, I'm, I'm, of course, now I can't right. sum a single title, but I think you, you all know what, what 
I've talked about. Um, there was a movie at Sundance this year called The Tale with Laura Dern, um, which showed at Sundance as a movie and then got bought by HBO. Right. And yeah. so when it came to HBO, Matthew Gilbert, the Globe's television critic, reviewed it. But I ended up writing about it in a column because I saw it as a movie, and it's kind of it's a movie. There's, a, there's this sort of dichotomy. I don't know if yeah. everybody's aware that, for example, Cannes Film Festival is saying they're not going to take anything right. from Netflix right. uh, because they don't exhibit in theaters. Right. So how does yeah. that play out for critics? We go to Toronto instead. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, they're going to play somewhere. Um, no, no, I just meant in terms, well, in terms of coverage. Oh, yeah. um, I mean. Again, we cover everything because our idea is that not everybody can see what we're seeing. And especially, we're geared towards young people, like 18 to 20 something. And sometimes we just can't afford to go to the theater all the time. So, of course, we're going to cover the Netflix films and the Amazon films. And typically speaking, as well you should. Netflix films get our most highest right. count on our sites, like wow. because people are looking for things to stream. Yeah. So it would be a disservice to us to not cover those films, but right. we will also cover all the theatrical releases, but it's just, you know, if I'm we like have enough ball. writers. You're, you're covering the way people watch. Yeah, and yeah. I think I, I try to the do one that thing that's a leisure of our kind of site, which is all self-funded and very much a passion project, is that we get to cover what we want, and we want to cover everything we can. So. I mean, it just, I guess that's the way it affects us, is but that we also, just like, delegate. You go to the movies. I live in New York City. A movie ticket is 1650 right. right. Like, I can't, a lot of people don't have that money to gamble with. So, <laughs> of course, like, so of course you have to go and, you know, pe of course people are going to lean towards streaming services because it's cheaper. Right. Because the internet is free. And there's so now. many options now. Right. That it's not like you're getting a lesser assortment. Like, Correct. I know last year had Mudbound on Netflix, and that's right. one of the to me, it was one of the best films last year. So I think, I and think there is And they did turn around and theatrically re release it, so yeah. it could be available for the Academy Award. But, and that brings up a good point that you're making uh, about these films are going directly to streaming, which is, I wonder at what point in time that the, and it'll be the Academy probably to, to do it, they'll break the mold and sort of, you know, how do we, and then the question is, what's the difference between Emmys and the Academy Awards? I think there's gonna be a change in, in how films are classified, and that may change a lot of the things that y'all are touching upon right well, now. we're in the middle of an argument, yeah. of a, like a 10 year argument yeah. about what is a movie? Yeah. And the gray, the gray zone you're talking about is, you know, is where movies are living right now, you know, despite the artificial distinctions we make at my paper that, oh, the TV critic has to review this and the movie critic has to review that. You know, there are people out there who will argue that the third season of Twin Peaks is a movie, an 18 hour movie, and they've been having passionate arguments about it on Twitter, as because you know. Because if it's TV, it's lesser. Um, but it's David Lynch, so it's a movie. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and those arguments are, are all good, and we don't know where we are yet yeah. because we're evolving towards something new, and we don't know what that beast is going to look like yet. I mean, we have one time for one more oh. question. Sorry. Uh, one of the problems, though, I think it, uh, it, that uh, again, that um, relates to what a lot of these questions are about. It's just a matter of time and, unfortunately, money, too, though, where um, I only do theatrical films. We don't have a theater, I mean, a TV reviewer. We have a lot of theater reviewers, but we, we don't have a TV reviewer. I use wire for TV. Um, but I only have so much time, you know, to do that in addition to my other duties. and. And everybody, uh, to some degree, has to even, you know, even Ty, where it's, you know, his job is primarily seeing mov and writing about movies, but even he has limits. I mean, there are, <laughs> there are so many. There are so many options out there. I would love to well, see. Well, also, you know, what I do for yeah. relaxing is for, for relaxing is I come home and I watch TV series with my wife, and we yeah. hang out, and you know, and and and, and I, because I want to keep up with all the TV series yeah. that everybody yeah. is talking about. Yeah, I mean, I love the, the one of the great things about film festivals, and and certainly Woods Hole's always been, I think, a leader in this is uh, with uh, you know exposing audiences to short films. Mm. I've had short films on my ten best lists at the end. I love short films. Whenever I go to a festival, I always I was I went to the shorts last night, and when the independent film festival because they're just movies I would never otherwise right. see, yeah. and just and I'm always blown away uh, by them too. Um, the other stuff I figure I can catch up with, you know, yeah. at some point in time. So it's it's nothing against the art form, or or you know, it's not like oh well, we're critics that's beneath us. It's nothing like that. It's just the challenge of, you know, I, Judy's so great. She sent me like. 
links to something like eight movies, I did not have time to see one before the film festival. <coughs> I did not have time, you know? So, but it's not that I didn't want to, and I will still hopefully get to them. So but it, that's the, the problem is the challenge of how many people. So we have time for one more question. This well, this is a question maybe targeted at the two young, young film critics. One of the challenges in the film industry now, and I mean, oh, one, everybody can have an opinion on it, is uh, one of the challenges that is that film festivals and films in general are attracting an older audience and how to get younger. Younger people. I mean, you're writing about. You say you want to write about films for younger people, but they're not coming to films. So what's what is? Um, so, but clearly you think that they are. So I, I'm just curious as to what the strategy is behind writing about films to get younger people interested to hear younger voices. I of, guess films. I think we might live a bit in a bubble with Where that. Where did you hear that? Because um, we. Where did you hear that? Well, look. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, this is I this is you know, a very. This is a very, uh, this is not like your typical film festival. Um, this area, when you look at the demographic of this oh, area, then yeah. there will be, you know, then of course there are oh, going true. to be older people. But I'm curious, is that, a is that a statistic that exists across the movie, across the movie realm? Or is yeah, that something movie, that? Yeah, the movie, movies are, the, except for blockbusters, audiences for movies are, I, theatrical audience. Yeah, the theatrical, theatrical audience. Again, and that's a crucial distinction. Okay. I think. Again, that's the, where I was confused. Yeah, and again, I, it's the bubble because I think we see a lot of people who are super enthusiastic mm -hmm. and are our age and are like us. And I think it's just a matter of maybe we have to be a little choosier about how often we go and see these movies. I think that's why the Netflix films are easily the most clicked on articles on my site. So I do think the audience is still there. And I just think <laughs> we're picking and choosing, maybe. But I, I think write, the enthusiasm's I also, there. I also write differently when it's a film. I, I guess I write, any film that I write, I try to target even my writing and language for a younger audience to make it more accessible to them. Yeah. Um, block, I get a ton of invites for blockbusters, and I, and I don't see a lot of them anymore. Because I can see him at any, any time. Yeah. But last year, um, I forgot the name of the director, but a film called Lady Macbeth came out. And that was a film that I had to sit down and really think about the review and how to attract. And so I thought about different things that young people, what are the discussions that young people are having that relate to this film? Mm -hmm. And I add that as a part of my review as a way to get people, and, younger people interested mm -hmm. in and that. it's a niche thing too. So I try to cover specifically often women directed films because I think that there are a lot of young women who want to see themselves more represented on screen and want to see writers who are succeeding enough <laughs> in film criticism and um, so I think it's also about like you know you either write to the audience you're trying to reach or you cover things for the audience you're ty trying right. to reach that you know? may not be you know that may not be the greatest to, answer but to, yeah that's yeah, the one I have but I get it we do have the heroic film uh, heroic women uh, programming going on right now in Boston, which... And it's I, wonderful. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I want, oh. I, can I just point yeah. out, one thing I should point out, really, is the fallacy of thinking that theatrical is everything. It's, and I agree that the theatrical audience is, is, is aging. Um, and, you know, I live in suburban Boston, and we have, you know, we joke that the West Newton Cinema, which is like our local cinema, every time I go there, I'm the youngest person there by about <laughs> five decades. Um, <laughs> you know, and... and, and but I also have daughters who are, you know, a little younger than these guys, and, and they are movie hounds, and their friends are movie hounds, and they're watching movies all the time, not necessarily in theaters, um, some of them not necessarily legally at all. Um, I tell the story about my, my barber, who is a guy who loves movies and is not particularly sophisticated by my lights about movies. He just likes what he likes. And I remember one time he said, hey, Ty, did you see that new uh, Leo DiCaprio movie, The Relevant? I said, The Revenant? He says, yeah, The Relevant. Uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I said, yeah, it's really good. That's a really good movie to see on a big screen. And he said, well, I saw it on my phone. And I'm like, you saw it on your phone? And the movie was like, had just come out the week before. He said, yeah, I got it off this, this pirate you know, app that I have where you dial into like a Romanian, you know, an Estonian server. And, see, and he's, he's dialing up the relevant 
you know, with Leo DiCaprio in the bear, and I'm watching it on, you know, so I'm getting my hair cut on his phone, and I'm thinking, this is a horrible, horrible way to see movies, but it's how he sees movies. At least he's enthusiastic. It's, it's, and, and, and you know what? And if you like, he said it's a really good movie, I think I'll actually pay to see it in the theater. And I think he's representative. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm making fun of him, but not really. He's representative. I think there are a lot of people out there. That's how they watch movies. Thank you.